My background is architecture. And I believe design and architecture, it's essentially a personal search. We look within ourselves and somehow we try to mirror what we see or what we understand of what we see. And I began in, in 67, essentially, that's where my eyes opened up and started looking at nature as the prime source for understanding the world. And th therein began the idea that there might be something like the way nature is integrated, there might be a universe, and then it might be built in the manner, perhaps the way nature builds. Now those are not formed exactly in that manner, but in the early 70s, I started going to conferences in genetics and structural biology, met most of the people around there, and then the idea occurred to me that they, just like in nature, there is a universal code, there must be one like this for architecture. So that set the agenda, and I'm still trying to sort it out, nowhere near it, and I believe to, central to that would be a shape code, what I call a morphological genome, or a morph genome, you can use any word for that, and that'll be one that'll give us the entire universality, an equivalent universality we see in nature. Now, for it to be universal, the only language we have is mathematics. That's the only thing we can agree on. The rest we're not going to agree on, I think. So a shape code must be based on mathematics. So, and, and the building blocks of mathematics are numbers. So I use numbers as a way to code them. So there are different meanings of numbers. There's first, second, third. There are so many people around me. There's so much distance away from me. All those are different meanings of numbers. All are embedded in like a universal code. Um, all talk about genetics and things heads towards, I believe, architecture, as you know, is heading towards biology. And all talk about it, it will go towards growing architecture. An idea Bill, you heard in the morning, he, he suggested that about 50 years ago. And it's rare in the history of architecture that someone is at least 100 or 150 years ahead of time. So we are still, in a way, catching up to the vision. The other citation is the great Florentine architect, uh, Vittorio Giorgini, who pretty much, in a, in a parallel course, came up with something about the same, not quite the same thing. And he said, we, can, we should be building using nature's methods. So he, he hit upon the idea of fabrication and making all in the making of architecture. And he said that technology, building technology, took a wrong turn when we embraced cutting and joining. That's the fundamental basis of fabrication, much of fabric, not all of it. And he said, wait a minute, nature's design strategy is you make seamless things, you make them all continuous. So he said that should be the basis to go. And then he invented topological architecture. So the one building, the first topological building in the world was built 50 years ago. It's a true Mobius strip, continuous surface, and made almost like ferrocemento type construction, which is reinforced with mesh, thin little concrete, and you have an, an envelope. On the right is his experiment in America. In fact, this is a Pratt legacy because Pratt students built that. That's a two-story building, never got built, first topological structure in America and the largest one in the world. Unfinished, unfortunately, but the idea was build it like paper mache, which is take steel meshes, eight feet by four feet, and you bend them as you climb up and remember, scaffolding, all little, little poles, one by one, two by twos, et cetera, holding this thing up. So uh, Vittorio set the stage, I believe, for what's going on now and some of the things that are going around. My own work. Okay. Um, the diagram you see, the base is, 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 is already old, five years ago, and I'm calling it Morph Genome. It's already 1.1. I've gone through several generations. I'm working on 2.0. Uh, series, uh, and every time you add, you, you sort of encompass more. The idea is that a shaped genome must be built of genes, and all genes will be independent of each other. That's the trick. That's where it's hard, it's a slow process, because, and when you try to map a gene out, you don't want it to collide with all the other genes. So they're all completely independent. And a gene means essentially a group of ways you can change or, or uh, change a shape, basically. It's, for example, if you took a square, what are the different ways to change it? I believe they're infinite, the answer is infinite, okay? And I'm mapping 
every possible change that can take place to ch that can take that can change every shape in every possible way. That's what I'm mapping. And what you see is a diagram. So the radii that go out are all genes. They branch out into little tips, which are essentially the rules. Those are the rules. So you map all the rules of all the possible ways of changing shape in one space, and that becomes like a seed for a universe of shapes. So you plant it, it'll propagate with the rules and keep going essentially forever because some of these things go for infinity. Next, please. Um, what I do is, here's one use. I'll show you examples of how I map this. And um, just to give you a flavor of this, I think this is not complete work. I believe I'm still within the 1 to 10% of the problem. So it's really, you should see the intention of the work and not what the results are. For example, if you take a triangle, it has three angles. If you assign a number to each angle and you do all possible ways of doing all three numbers, then you've got all possible triangles possible, mathematically possible. So that is the universe of a triangle. And the seed is on the left, those little branches that you see. Likewise, or more interesting, that these numbers are not just discrete, they're continuous. So you can go from one to, the, uh, one to two through all the decimal places. So what are called real numbers. You know. Likewise, you can take any, in this case, polygon, and just flip numbers, and they're changing, and the shape is morphing. So morphing is building, built in into the idea of the genome I'm talking about. The two are the same thing. And for example, I'll give you a few examples of sampling through this universe. This is all blobby type of shapes. You've seen many of these around. I believe it requires three groups of numbers, therefore three genes. So this is a three gene operation. Or take these, which require only two genes. And you can see this is a portion a diagram. And if you continue the diagram, it goes to infinity one way, infinity the other way. So in fact, you're mapping infinities which, of course, you know, cannot be done. So therefore, I'm doing something like an impossible task. And that's not such a bad idea, because if it's not possible, nobody can do it. And if you don't reach there, you don't feel so bad, OK? <laughs> great. It's a great strategy. You've got to, you've got to try it, OK? Um, and and we, a thing like this with Bucky, Fuller's domes, et cetera, require, in my opinion, three genes. In fact, if you look at the numbers on the right, 30, 31, 32, the last digits, you're changing only one digit to get the next one. One digit is one base, just like in DNA sequences, one base. So each number is a base. And I, I'm mapping about 25 genes so far. So uh, the human body has 26,000 genes. The number, the four alphabet, ATCG, and um, three billion characters. I'm working with about 200, 300 characters, maybe about seven to 10 genes that are mapped about, 25 of them. So it's nothing, it's, it's a tiny fraction of what's possible. This thing is a group of shapes, which one of the more interesting genes, it gives you all these rosette type things, seed pods and, and florets and clover, clover shades, flowers, etc. This one requires at least four genes. This is using Wolfram's cellular automata rules. Wolfram said the cellular automata he wasn't his invention, but his systematization of the rules was his contribution. And he would say, you have some, some cells, you put some neighborhood relationships, and make them propagate according to certain rules, and you'll get patterns. And, you, and they appear from, from, from regular patterns to irregular patterns all through one scheme. And that one requires four genes. A little more complicated version of that requires at least seven genes. And the diagram that left each color is a different gene. And the, and the linear code at the bottom is, 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 is this number sequence. So in this space, you don't need to do cellular automata. That's certainly one interesting way. But you could find your own automata. And I discovered something here, which is the infinite class. I'll show you one example of this, which is on the screen where you take only one number. These are all 
one number is changing and the pattern is changing. So you get regularity, you get irregularity, you get emergence, you get all through one in just one number. And it's great satisfaction to think that when we do these things, we encounter what may be nature's using, but we don't know for sure. And this image on the right is a computer image. It has a number code at the bottom. That's how we generated it. And on the left, you see a shell. If you look at the edge-on view, uh, it looks like the spiral like that. So this is, I'm not saying this is true, but this is a candidate for morphogenesis of patterns in nature, maybe. And we, we, we tried this idea to making actual, actual products and to test it out in the real world and worked with the company, I'm still working with Milgo Bufkin, uh, with metal, metal, the, the metal company, and the idea was to apply morphogenetic coding to making of objects. And six billion people, six billion variations, model for mass customization, we had about four to six genes operating in this, something of that order, and we could get infinite uh, variations on the column using one material, one method of fabrication. So that was a great success as a model. Uh, and then we thought, well, let's test if it works for real architecture, and can we decode existing things? So Gaudi is one of my favorite architects, and I look at his work, I've been looking for years and years, and still not quite done, but here's a very simple, uh, his, his Parkwell colonnade, which is made out of masonry, but if you see it as a mathematical surface, it seems to require four genes shown by the diagram at the bottom left, like a seed, and then various morphings to get to the actual colonnade. Those are just those are pretty simple ways to stretch them, shrink them, tilt them, etc. Okay, uh, my work basically has two directions. One is you saw numbers as, as a genetic coding device, which is essentially software. Architecture, you know, is software and hardware. The hardware part, we're doing some experiments and we're working, again, this, all this work is being happening at Milgo, um, and we, we, we're trying to see what, maybe the genetic code isn't enough, and there might be something outside of that. So I'm trying to see, and that's called epigenom epigenomics, so you have genomics, gene, gene generated, epigenomics, lying outside of that. So we're trying to see how that can mesh together in the making of, of spaces and structures. Uh, the idea began, here we're using force, which is the epigenetic component. It's not in the genes. And uh, on the top left is the famous experiment by Gaudi, hanging, cha hanging chains and looking at mirrors, seeing reflections and visualizing what the cathedral will look like, Sagrada Familia, Colonia Guel. He built like those. And on the right, Fry Otto extended the idea and, and made grids on the floor and, and jacked them up to make the surface. Our invention here is probably the third in the lineage where we are saying you don't need a grid, you need little plates, little facets, which are like plates, so they make a shell made out of tiny, tiny plates. But the key is it's one sheet of material. We laser cut it, we form it, and here's the magic. When we form it, we don't have a computer model for it. We have no engineering for it. It's all empirical work, not hands-on, it's hands-off, we don't touch it. It's all nature is forming it. Here's what we get. We, form, we pay for the forming, all the setup and things. We get the space inside for free. We get the curvature for free. We get the strength for free. We get the openings for free. That's a lot of free stuff, you know. And in other words, physical emergence is a technology which we're trying to find and use and leverage. And these are various examples. Somebody mentioned the exhibit. If you go there, you'll see some, uh, some projects of that nature. Some close-ups of that. Remember, these are single sheets. They're not, these things are not welded together. They start flat. All we do is activate force in different ways. And interesting, when you do irregular things, they have a mind of their own because these things start to twist and turn. We have absolutely no control over it. I believe in future we will be able to make digital models, we'll be able to engineer them, but right now it's all empirical and it's sort of dangerous because we don't know when we are pushing the limit because these could fly in your face and actually hurt you very much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really true, literally true in fact. 
And here's the evidence of seamlessness, where with a very simple shape, uh, metal sheets come about certain width, four feet, five feet, six feet. We want to build larger, and we seam them. The idea that after forming, they should be continuous. And here's the evidence. Some more larger things. That's about the, we built a few of these about 16 feet across. You can see the seams there. And, and small little experiment like these things make us realize when we form these things, we don't control the opening size. It just makes it like that. And it seems to me that here, and, and you see nature at work. You, you, you get a feeling that nature is using force to script matter. I mean, that's fundamental stuff. And the second uh, technology that we've invented for seamlessness is this, where we, we use, apply tension to the surface, uh, flat surface, in this case, laser cut, and we form these things. So you get all the tension forms that produce without the, the poles that are needed for tents, without cables pulling it, it's, it's just one piece. At the bottom right, extremely ex interesting example, it started folding itself, it's reminiscent of seed pods and, and flowers and things like that. What we're trying to do is uh, create topological surfaces out of very simple action of force. These are continuous surfaces. They are made out of one sheet. And, and recently, I came across the example on the left, which is a palm tree, the bark of the palm tree. Uh, the palm tree is about this wide. They rise about 60. This is a canary palm, rise about 60 feet. Absolute miracle, because these light brown things, it looks like what we are doing. And nature's invented millions and millions of years ago. And, and the, 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 this light brown color, which is hardened, at this point hardened wood, but at some point it was pulpous mass, and look what it's doing. So here nature has invented like hydraulic jacks is sort of self-jacking, and it's an anti-gravity device. So, so a model becomes how to model these things conceptually and physically, taking genetic codes and take uh, external things and put it all together into making things like this which fight the, the common logic of how things are built. Thank you very much. Yeah.